Welcome, uh, my name is Sebastian. Um, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, load and performance tests uh, in the cloud. And um, I would like to, to give a brief overview of what I actually mean by that and why and how you can do, do performance tests. Um, um, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is uh, Sebastian. Um, it is on Twitter and GitHub and the internet. And um, for the last uh, seven something years, I've done lots of consulting and development work with a, with a strong performance uh, focus on performance and architecture, software architecture and system architecture. And this ultimately led to the founding of Stormforger uh, now two and a half years ago, where we build tools and a platform and services, and, and we offer services around load testing and performance testing, basically HTTP-based uh, systems. Um, and now before we actually dive into um, the topic of uh, performance testing and load testing, um, I would like to uh, yeah, define or talk about some, some of the, uh, uh, or give some definitions uh, about some of the basic uh, words that are involved in this topic. Um, and the first one would be uh, performance. And it's quite interesting that, that performance is often understood in multiple ways and um, used interchangeably with other terms that we will come to. Um, and I would just want to make sure that we are here on the same page what we are t actually talking about. Um, so performance is the, oh, that's interesting, uh, uh, the ability of a system to fulfill a task within a well-defined dimension. Um, and this is uh, basically efficiency. Uh, so the task could be a transaction or a web request or something <laughs> like that. And the dimension could be time, then we get something like response time, or it could be memory usage, disk usage, or even money. Uh, so you could also define performance in terms of the efficiency, how, how much does it cost to, to serve, a, serve a specific transaction? Um, so the statement like one server can do two, 250 transactions per second within a defined quality uh, criteria would be a statement of the efficiency of the system or about the performance of the, of the system. This is heavily simplified, of course. Um, and the next term I would like to uh, talk about, which is often used interchangeably with performance is uh, scal scalability. Um, and actually, they are not that much the same. They are not really, really uh, comparable uh, to, to one another. Um, where performance was the efficiency of a system to fulfill the task within a defined dimension, scalability, on the other hand, describes the effectiveness on how you can grow capacity of your system by adding resources. So the, the degree on how effective you are in translating resources in, into capacity. Um, and if you take the statement from before, like one server does 250 requests per second within a defined quality uh, range, then the statement of 10 servers can do tenfold uh, would be uh, would be actually a very, uh, very good scalable system, like 100% of all the additional resources are translated into additional capacity for the system, or throughput in this case. Um, there's, um, there are different, different mathematical models and categories to describe scalability, which I won't go into, um, but just to give you a, a good distinction uh, of what performance means and what scalability means, because that will become uh, important later on in this talk. So um, I would like to, to ask a question that was asked by uh, Jonas bon Bonner. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. He's the founder and CTO of Lightband, the ACA framework. Maybe someone heard of it. Um, and he gave a presentation, I think many years ago, where he asked two really nice questions. The first one was, how do you know that you have a performance problem? And the answer is, if your system is slow for a single user, then you have a, perf uh, have a performance problem. Um, I like the sloth. Um, and the next question he, he asked in this presentation was, obviously, how do you know if you have a scalability problem or a scaling problem? And the answer is, yeah, if your system might be or is fast for, for a single user, but really slow under, under heavy load. 
or high traffic. Um, and this is a really nice, nice visualization of yeah, what, um, what, what is the core difference between performance and scalability. Um, and um, yeah, Robert, Robert Johnson, he was the director of software engineering at Facebook, wrote an interesting article in the Facebook engineering blog or so uh, in 2010, I think, where Facebook was really small, like 500 million users. Uh, they, they just reached 500 million users. Um, and he, he, he talked about how they do um, performance optimization projects and scalability, uh, scalability improvement projects at Facebook. And they, he, he made a couple of really interesting statements. First was, um, yeah, that, that scaling usually hurts performance. So they are contradicting each, each other. And also that, that efficiency projects, so uh, efficiency means performance, um, um, that, that efficiency projects really give you um, yeah, enough improvement to have a big enough effect on scaling. So they are reaching a, an area where it is more effective overall to, to have a better scaling system versus a better performing system. So they are sacrificing efficiency for scalability. Um, and, and another quote was that um, efficiency is important too, but they think of it as a separate project from, uh, uh, from scaling. So they separate it, th this completely. So next up, performance testing. So now we know what performance is and what is not. Um, and now we take a look at what performance testing actually, actually means. Um, and the best definition, this is a slide completely in English. Uh, because the English Wikipedia is, such, uh, is much, much better than the German one. Um, and the article on, uh, the, 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 the article on um, software performance testing, I think it is, um, has a really, really nice description of performance testing. So when you do performance testing, or, or it is a pract testing practice in general, where you um, yeah, um, determine how, how a system performs under a particular a workload and you'll take a look at the responsiveness and stability of this uh, of the system that you are testing. Um, and to put it in, in, in other, other terms, um, you, they, they all have in common, or the, the, this is a category of, of testing methods and testing practice, and they all have in common that they all induce a well-defined workload to, uh, to a system that is under test, or SUT, system under test. And you, you do that in order to observe the system's behavior and to verify performance-related characteristics or if you, if you, if you need to um, guarantee certain service levels, then you, you, you can use performance tests in order to verify those characteristics. Um, and uh, you also want to do performance tests to simply understand the, the behavior, the, the internal behavior of your system that you are testing. Um, there are lots of yeah, categories or sub-testing methods that could be summarized as performance tests. Um, they are not all very well, yeah, well defined, or it is oftentimes not as simple as it sounds to to say, okay, this is a stress test, this is a spike test. It's it's um, it's more about what the what the goal is uh, that you want to achieve. Uh, for for selecting the the right testing 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 methods in your in your case, but we will go into some of those testing techniques uh, later later in this talk. So now we have one final piece um, to to make the talk title complete. We have to talk about this cloud thing. So the cloud. Um, I'm not here to to sell you the cloud. I just want to describe what we have by. Uh, um, yeah, all those uh, cloud cloud vendors uh, that are available to us. We get basically infrastructure as a service. So we get networks, compute, storage, and all those things. We get a platform as a service sometimes. But but the most important thing is that we get APIs and automatization um, across uh, all those services and components. Um, and we get this on demand, which makes it really easy to to to, to achieve a cost-effective and scalable uh, system. So um, now to the to the actual uh, topic. So what what about performance tests in in this cloud? Um, and you could now ask uh, the question: Why is this now relevant? Because I just told you that the cloud is scaling for you. You just buy more stuff. 
uh, swipe your credit card once more uh, and boot up more servers, whatever. Um, and the obvious problem with that is um, that, that scaling resources doesn't necessarily mean to scale an application. This is only true if you are, um, if, you, if you have a very well-defined uh, system and software architecture that, that, that powers your entire application. Um, and to give you a really, really stupid and simple example um, how this isn't true or this, no, might skip that. Um, so, so maybe you're running in the AWS cloud, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it doesn't really matter. Maybe you have a, a, an automatic load balancer that scales automatically for you, which is, which is great and fine. There are pitfalls there as well, but in general, you're good. Um, then you have your applications or, or web server tier that, that you have um, provisioned in, a, in an auto-scaling group, which means that it will automatically add more resources to your problem if you have a higher throughput or higher load on your, on your system. And then, of course, you have a, yes, some sort of, of a persistence layer maybe behind that. And if you, if you have this scaling well, this scaling well, and only one master server, for example, then your thing will break eventually. So it, it, it is, it is maybe, maybe a too simple example, but just to give you an idea that you just can't ramp up your resources and get automatically more, more capacity out of, out of the system. Um, if, you, if you are a bit familiar with, uh, with the, the cloud services that are available today, then you might think of what about all those fully managed services that, that you get from them, where the provider actually cares about everything. You just say what you need and how much you need and you pay for it and they, they manage basically um, all the provisioning of the resources below that higher level service. Um, examples for that would be AWS Lambda or the Google Compute equivalent. I think it's called Functions, but I'm not really sure. There is this um, DynamoDB database and data store and data st and event streams and queues and everything. And those services are, aren't really resources, but, but they are yeah, high, higher level services that are managed by the, uh, by the cloud, pr cloud provider for you. So in this case, um, yeah, what is, what is the problem with that? And basically it, it boils down to, um, to complexity. And uh, complex systems are, oh God, what, what, what is Wechselwirkung in English? I have no idea. Uh, um, yeah, if, if systems interact with each other uh, in, in, a, in a high degree, then they are complex. And this is something that I've taken from, uh, from the physics uh, area. So the problem is complexity. Um, and the complexity hasn't simply vanished. It's, it's not like that magically you are moving from your on-premise data center to the cloud and everything is simple and easy. Um, it might be easier to get started and to, to, to build um, yeah, more sophisticated systems, but in the end, either you have some additional complexity there or your provider is managing the complexity for you. So, so, so most of it, or some of the complexity is hidden and uh, other complexity is, yeah, yeah, it has shifted from, 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 from your side and from your operations team, for example, to the teams at AWS and Azure and whatever. Um, but it turns out that uh, this complexity often um, has a non-trivial impact on performance characteristics of your system. And this is especially true for all those fully managed services uh, that are, uh, are available. Um, and the only thing that you can do to, um, to, to deal with this complexity is uh, building up a good understanding on what you are actually dealing with. And First of all, you have to know your own application, your own, applica uh, your own software architecture and system architecture that, that, you are, that, that you are responsible for, that you are designing in terms of uh, performance characteristics. Um, yeah, so system software architecture, uh, and all, you, you also need to know your runtime environment. And in this example, it would be uh, the cloud runtime environment that you are using. And this also extends to all those services that you are utilizing for example, from the AWS cloud or from any other, any other cloud vendor and all those other third-party vendors that you are using, 
I don't know, uh, logging as a service, database as a service. There are so many as a service things that you could possibly use. And you need to have a basic understanding, at least a basic understanding, what is happening there when, uh, when, when, when you have a certain yeah, traffic scenario or load scenario on your, on your system. So, and this um, is quite, it is quite obvious that you, of course, need also uh, conduct performance tests and load tests and all those kinds of testing in, in, in the cloud. And um, I would like now to, to, to go uh, briefly over some of the um, yeah, more important um, testing methods and take a look at uh, what they actually mean and what you, what you can achieve with those. Um, and what is uh, particular important when it, when, when it comes to doing, uh, looking at the cloud. You said we have to build understanding what's going on. Yeah. I fully agree with that. But the problem with all this cloud stuff is that they try to make fog. They make fog. So we cannot understand in APIs yeah. what's exactly going on. Yeah. And, and let me, let, let me quickly re repeat the question and then move the discussion later on. The, the question was in the, um, yeah, how, how, can you, how can you build up an understanding of a system that is not open, right? Is it, or visible, or, uh, okay, now, yeah, but, but let's skip this discussion to, uh, to later. Um, okay, first off, we have load testing, which is maybe the simplest and, yeah, no, it's the simplest form of a performance test. Uh, where you uh, induce uh, a normal or an expected workload to your system and you want to take a look at the, maybe at the latency, at the throughput or error rates or uh, whatever criteria that, that is important uh, to you. And you usually do that in order to verify non-functional requirements or to, to see if you are able to, to hold your, your service level agreements. Um, yeah, but that's basically what I want to say about load testing. The other testing methods are a bit more interesting. Stress testing, for example, um, is uh, basically a load test, but you are, go you are now explicitly going beyond the normal or expected workload that, that you, that you um, expect to see on your, on your system. Um, and you do that to, to see how the system behaves um, in, uh, at its design limits, for example, or when you, um, um, no, you, yeah, you, you want to under, understand how your system behaves at, at those limits. Um, and you can also utilize stress testing or a series of stress testing to figure out what the capacity of your system actually is. You can increase the traffic over time and then uh, see the point when, uh, when you violate your quality criteria or maybe when your system eventually yeah, it doesn't serve any requests at all because, uh, I don't know, uh, the server died or so. Um, oh yeah, um, yeah, I just told you that. Uh, you have to define quality criteria, but that's basically the same with a load test. Uh, and then you, you steadily in increase the traffic in multiple phases, for example, and you see when, uh, and, and, and you take a look at when you are hitting the, um, or when you are violating the, uh, the, the quality criteria that you defined before. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah. Um, right. And when you when, when you conduct a, a stress test, it's it's really important to have a, um, a deep look, at, or you, you you have the ability to have a deep look at your uh, at your system. So you should have all your monitoring tools and profiling tools available, so that you can actually learn something when you when you are inducing the traffic. Uh, in, into your into your system, and you can use a stress test not only to, to to see what the capacity is obviously, but you can also start to identify the next bottlenecks. For example, if you want to push the boundary even further, and so so you, you need to have some data and idea where to look next in order to improve the performance uh, of your uh, of your system. And it's a good tool, uh, like I already said, to to determine the capacity per resource. So you can do a stress test. Um, and just use one application server, for example, and then uh, see how much users or how much requests or how much acts you can handle using that particular resource. 
And um, with that idea in mind, you can basically do um, a scalability test. You, you can, you can um, now change the perspective on to yeah, how, how effectively can you translate more resources into more capacity to your system, more, more requests per second, more, more users, and so on. Um, and this is basically the, the foundation for capacity planning and cost estimation because um, you are maybe a fancy startup or so and you haven't even launched a product but you have a hockey stick growth and you know that you have, I don't know, tenfold the users per month or so, um, then you need to know uh, what, 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 uh, what, what will it cost in order to, um, to handle, handle this, this uh, scenarios, these growth scenarios. And what you do for a scalability, a scalability testing is basically a series of uh, stress tests where you um, say, okay, you have maybe, maybe five resources, like five servers, uh, and you measure when do you begin to violate your quality criteria. And in this case, it's, it's, I don't know, 170 capacity, maybe requests per second, or concurrent users, or connections, it doesn't really matter. And then you add more resources, maybe more application servers, and then you get maybe yeah, roughly the uh, double the throughput, and then you do it again, add more resource, and, and over, over time, most certainly, it will flatten out. And this is now a good um, basis to, uh, to see, okay, uh, maybe we, not, we just need to go in that area, and we are basically good because it works as we uh, expect it to work. We have almost linear growth, um, perfectly fine, but if you want, if we need to go here, then we might have a problem, and we, we might actually, actually need to act immediately to, to fix this uh, scenario. Um, to give you a comparison, um, um, or wait, um, I, I, I initially talked about performance versus scalability, and that uh, Facebook actually separates this into two different project areas. So what now, uh, what will happen if you increase the performance by 10%, then you will get something like that. Basically the same curve, but 10% higher. But what happens if you, if you fix the scalability problem, then you, maybe in the beginning it's more or less the same, but, but uh, the more you grow or you, the more resources you add, the more um, impact does a scalability project have on, on performance. And I'm not, saying that, that you should only focus on scalability because most of us doesn't, don't really run such a big system that this will really be, be, be a problem. But it is important to, 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 to see the difference so that you actually know what you are aiming for when you are working on performance or scalability. Um, okay. mm. Next up, we have um, spike testing. And spike testing is trying to answer the question, how does your system behave under extreme load spikes? Um, and you want to know, do you, can, can you, can you utilize the elasticity of the cloud good enough? And can you react fast enough to, to sudden changes in, in the traffic pattern that you are seeing at your, at your system? Um, there are several reasons where you have, uh, where, where you can actually plan uh, those scenarios. For example, the um, marketing division has a, a crazy idea to send a push notification to half a million users at the same time, and maybe you want to prepare for such a scenario or talk them out of it to, to distribute it more over the day, or you have a mailing campaign or advertisement spot on, uh, on TV or, or stuff like that. Or maybe maybe you are Really about to release a big feature, and you, you, um, yeah. The, again, maybe the marketing division says, "Oh, this will go viral 100%," and then you, you need to be prepared um, for those uh, scenarios. And basically, what you are doing is you are uh, running running a load test, but you compress the 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 traffic to to very sharp uh, spike essentially, and you are then taking a look at how good can you absorb this uh, spikes, where does your system fail first, how does it fail, which is really good information, especially when you are in this situation that your ops people actually know what to do and how to, how to mitigate maybe such a sudden increase uh, in, uh, in traffic. 
Um, then we have uh, soak testing, sometimes also called endurance testing, which is yeah, kind of like the opposite of a spike test where you basically want to know how your system behaves under a very, um, yeah, under, under a maybe normal load uh, situation, but for a very long, um, uh, long time. Uh, and it, it, this is basically yeah, a long load test. Uh, the, the definition of long is yeah, up to you basically, but normally it means uh, many, many hours, maybe even days. That kind of depends on what application you're looking at. If it's an application that you are only deploying once a quarter, then maybe you want to run a longer test because you know that your systems are running for longer periods of time. But if you are I don't know, crazy deploying like 50 times a day or so, then maybe it's not that important to, to ensure that you can run the system for many days without any memory leaks or disks spilling up or whatever. And it's um, also, also quite uh, nice to do um, yeah, performance troubleshooting, maybe in that area. Um, I had a, uh, I, I worked on, a, on, a, on an advertisement server um, and we had a, really strange situations where for, I don't know, one, one day or two, um, after a deployment, we suddenly see strange CPU spikes on those, uh, um, on those ad servers. Um, and then we basically did an um, artificial test that, 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 is, um, uh, that was aimed to, to look at a specific code path. And then we just hammered it for like 10 hours or so, made many, many billion, billions of requests, and yeah, then finally saw, um, saw what, uh, what the problem, problem is. And this is what, what I meant but by those testing methods aren't really clearly distinguished. It's, it's, it's kind of a soak test, but it's also kind of a yeah, performance troubleshooting test. Um, you, um, yeah, get the idea. Okay, next up is the, actually the, I think the most important testing methods when, it's, uh, when, when, when it comes to the cloud, um, and this is configuration testing. And configuration testing now changes the perspective to um, what kind of changes do you see in the observable behavior of the system when you are changing the, the environment. Normally you're not changing the, 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 the environment, but you're changing the test, and now you are actively changing the system that you are testing uh, and run the same test over and over again to get a comparison between multiple sets of uh, configurations. Can we do this? I will, I will come to that. Give me a minute. Um, so this implies that you have to do a series of tests, obviously, because with one test you can't, can't compare anything to, uh, to something. Um, and um, it is a really nice uh, technique to, to learn about the environment that you are running in. Um, and to give you some examples, um, what I'm actually talking about uh, when I th talk about configuration, um, when we go from top to bottom in, in the cloud, th this would be yeah, starting with instance types, for example. You have compute optimized, memory optimized, I.O. optimized, and whatever instance types. You have different sizes and burst performance and normal performance and whatever. Um, and this, this is, a, um, yeah, I think the, the most practical example on what you want to do uh, when, you, uh, when you are running in the cloud and you want to do a performance uh, configuration, configuration test. Maybe you want to do it to, to increase the throughput, but maybe you are also want to do this in order to get roughly the same throughput, but at a yeah, much lower, uh, lower cost, which would be yeah, optimizing the cost efficiency in that, in that regard. Um, then we have many other services. I just took a couple of examples here. Autoscaling configuration, for example, where you um, have to define uh, scaling. Uh, you, you basically define a group of servers and then you define scaling policies, when to add more resources, how long to wait before adding even further resources, when to scale down, how, how long does it take to, to, add, to, to boot up the, those new instances be, before they become available. Those are there are many, many um, parameters that go into uh, how to um, configure and how to deal with an autoscaling group that you maybe want to know how this behaves if you are actually um, um, yeah, using it um, beyond reading the documentation and clicking buttons in the, in the uh, UI. Um, 
Then there is uh, throughput provisioning. And what I mean by throughput provisioning are those managed services that I talked about earlier, where you basically say, okay, I want to have this event stream. I need, I don't know, 20 megabits of throughput there. Um, you can roughly model it um, about, um, against, your, um, against your business logic, but sometimes you forget to model bugs, for example, and then you, you, you see that you are injecting, oh, I'm sorry. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the main problem is you forget to model, uh, model issues that, that are not there by design. And um, you should always go ahead and, and, and run a dynamic test to figure out um, if you are actually right, right about your um, assertions there. Um, and the next point would be, yeah, the, 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 are you using the, those services that are offered by your, uh, by your cloud environment or maybe by other vendors, are you using them uh, in, in a right or optimal, uh, optimal way? Um, there are not only in the cloud, but basically everywhere, many pitfalls that uh, you can take when you, when you just start to lo look at uh, how, this, how those services and systems behave under, under load. Um, and the list goes on, obviously. This is not, not so much more cloud-specific, but you have the hypervisor most of the time when you run on a virtualized environment. And even on AWS, you have some little knob here uh, when it comes to the hypervisor that you can decide. Um, then you have the operation system level, obviously, network tuning, kernel tuning, all those settings that are, are available to us. Um, you have your web server, application server stack, where there are many configuration options, versions, dependencies that you can compare to one another, uh, but also software configuration, I don't know, like uh, database, connection pools, timeouts, uh, and so on and so forth, and also maybe even software dependencies, even things that you just use but don't um, manage by yourself can have a significant impact on the performance of your system. And with a configuration test, you can simply com uh, compare one version to another version or one TLS library to another TLS library and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and uh, configuration testing is actually something that we uh, do 100% of the time when we do uh, consultant work for uh, for our customers. So this is yeah the uh, the most important technique to um, yeah help them to improve their performance characteristics. Um, next up uh, is something that I haven't found in this uh, term actually, but um, I I'm not sure if I missed something. I like to call it availability or resilience testing. Um, this is a little bit inspired by the principles of chaos engineering. I don't know if you heard about them. It's from Netflix. They they offered a, uh, or they they published a manifesto, I think, where they all talk about um, how to um, how to really make sure that your system is uh, as resilient as possible. But anyhow. Um, all those, all those things I talked before are things that you have directly under control. Maybe you have also under control when and how you deploy, but um, most of the time you forget that you, sometimes you have to deploy even when your system is, a, is under, under heavy load. Uh, for example, if you need to roll out a hotfix because something is broken. Um, and maybe you want to do that without downtime. And um, then you have to ask you, uh, the question, or can you, or are you really sure that you can run a zero downtime deployment under heavy load? And this is something uh, you should also uh, at least think about testing and verifying those, um, those processes. Uh, and um, yeah. Um, the next thing is that when you're running in a cloud environment, you basically are confronted with constant changes to your infrastructure. There are uh, some um, um, automated tools that spin up new servers and shut them down again. Maybe you need something like a, like a service discovery tool and you want to, and are you really sure that you see the changes fast enough so that you don't run into any, any problems there? Um, so these are all, all those scenarios do happen all the time, but most of the time uh, someone or, yeah, it is simply forgotten that, that you should not only try this out on your dev environment and see, okay, the new server is booting up and the service is available and everything is good, 
but um, yeah, things suddenly change if you are seeing a lot of a lot of load on your on your system, and the list goes on f um, for failure scenarios and failover. Um, verifying that your failover mechanisms are actually working, what is happening if the, I don't know, network connection to your caching server gets slow or drops packets or the, uh, the one, one of the database read slaves suddenly dies. So do you, are, are, you, are you able to cope with, with those scenarios when you are confronted with, uh, with uh, a high traffic scenario? Um, yeah, okay. Then um, I would like to, to raise a question. So um, is, is this any different to what we actually did or um, um, had to do before we were uh, able to run those in the cloud and don't have to care about these servers uh, uh, our, ourselves anymore? And I would clearly answer this question with Jain. Um, I think that the... Um, the um, yeah the the requirement and the testing methods haven't really really changed. Basically, it's, it's it have been around for decades. Everyone knows what performance tests and load tests and such things were um, a long time ago. But what has really changed is the the uh, abilities or the possibility to to run those tests uh, uh, in the in the cloud context. And the most important thing here uh, to keep in mind is that test environments are something that is really interesting when you, when you take a look at the cloud and what the cloud actually provides you with. Um, if you really utilize all these APIs and automation uh, uh, possibilities, then suddenly it becomes really easy to uh, provision test environments, not, not QA environments, but really perform um, production grade performance test environments, or maybe even scale beyond the performance uh, the production environment to, to see if you, if you can handle larger, uh, larger um, traffics. Um, and by test environment, I mean everything from infrastructure, service, server, service configuration, code deployments, everything. If you, if you are able to, to automate this, then it might be really easy to, to spin up a performance test environment in the morning and, I don't know, maybe you have to wait one hour or so to load all the data into the environment, but then you have an environment that you can actually work and play, play with. And if you, if you do that correctly, then, then you can do this a lot more cost-effective and more flexible than we were used to do it. Um, I have one a more quick question. Um, is, uh, is someone working in an environment where you have one perf test environment where you can run like a quality, uh, uh, like, like a QA environment for performance? One hand, two hand, three? We try to use smaller regions for that. <laughs> okay. So, so you have, okay. Do you have uh, three environments more or more than three environments? Two, is he? Four. Ah, oh, nice. Okay. So, um, yeah, the the problem usually is that that performance uh, environments that are um, um, that are capable of of handling this traffic uh, and are comparable to a, to a production environment are really expensive because you just have to buy lots of resources to to mirror the production environment. And if you now have to do this like two, three, four, and more times, it, it, get, it gets even more, more expensive. And it is quite a, quite a mismatch because you have now these days this pizza-sized teams, like maybe, maybe 10 of them, and then you have to wait in, order, in, in line before you can actually yeah, um, do your uh, performance test of your feature or your product or your service that you are launching. Um, and I, I know it's... I know it's really hard, and maybe it's just a vision, but, but imagine that you can uh, provision such an environment on demand for the, for the period of time that you need it for, and then shut it down afterwards and save lots of money and time um, to, uh, to manage and uh, keep the systems uh, up and running 24-7, even if you're not using them 24-7. Um, okay, but there's uh, one um, remaining problem or one challenge which is um, yeah the 
ability to reproduce uh, your test environment perfectly. Even though if you can automate all those provisioning steps like, like uh, creating the infrastructure, networks, firewall rules, and servers and services, you have um, this little nasty thing called state in your system. You have uh, product databases, for example, but you also have a state in terms of uh, caches or file system caches, application. Uh, there, there are many, many areas where you have state in your, in your system. Um, and for me, it's a pretty much an unanswered question. How, to, how can you deal uh, in, a, in an elegant way so that you can set your system in, in, a, in a state that is um, a good starting point to make uh, comparable uh, performance tests. Um, and how do you, how do you manage those, uh, those test data? It's, uh, it's uh, quite, a, quite a challenging task, um, at least from, uh, from our, our experience. It's not so clear if, you're, if you can use production data, if you have to use fake data, is it comparable to production data? Is it too optimistic, too pessimistic? There are many challenges in, on, on how, to, how to create or deal with test data and how to, how to manage it. Maybe data schemas changes uh, for, for one feature and then you have to um, yeah, have a good mechanism in order to yeah, how to how, how to apply those data so it, that it stays comparable from from one environment uh, to another environment. Um, yeah, and how do you automate all those state handling and data handling uh, problem? I don't have a good answer for that. I'm uh, happy to hear what you think about it. Um, I'm uh, almost done. Uh, a quick recap. So. I talked about that uh, resources or scaling resources is not the same as scaling applications. Um, I think that um, most important thing why this is still the case is simply complexity. It's not, it's, it's still there. It's maybe hidden from us. Um, and the only way out of this problem is building up a better and good understanding on, on how our, our systems uh, behave. Um, and I would like to, to encourage you, if you are on, uh, already running stuff in the cloud, then think about doing the same um, yeah, um, work that, that, you, that you do in uh, pro provisioning your production environments um, and, and just uh, uh, try to apply this for uh, performance testing environments uh, as well. And in the end, you want to have the cycle, right? It's not only for software engineering or development, but you, it, it should also, also apply on all those non-functional criteria that we have just talked about. So you want to design, design something, you want to implement it, maybe not in code, but maybe in infrastructure. You want to um, measure it, you want, you, you want to validate it, and you want to do it over and over again. And um, this would be the end. <laughs> Thank you. So many hosting providers um, are switching from renting servers to renting services. So when, when, when I rent a service and performance varies every day, so what, what, what can I do for testing in this case? So the question is um, that uh, hosting, hosting providers are switching from servers to services, right? And you see, or you... Yeah, you I, rent, I rent a server, I rent a database. Yeah. And and you actually see a, a fluctuation in the in the performance of these services. Is that okay? Uh, uh, and how can I answer that? Uh, what was the actual question? Sorry. Um, what, what can I do in these cases? So just, just use uh, the testing tools, or do I have to okay. Yeah. Monitor okay. Monitoring okay. Um, so, so you 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 are now going from renting renting a server to to uh, renting a database, um, a managed database, uh, and you you fear now that that the quality of the performance of the system isn't as stable as it used to be by renting a server and managing the database yourself, right? Okay, um, so. Um, I think it doesn't really matter what kinds of tools you're using. Um, it's 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 not the it's it's not that there is any any difference uh, from um, from perf testing your own server with the database that you manage versus the database that you um, you basically rent. Um, 
because it, in, in the end it's a database, you can talk to it just the same, so you can basically use the same, same tools uh, to do that. Um, and and the, um, uh, your statement that, that you are seeing different performance uh, characteristics of those systems is, is, a, is a good argument for running these performance tests in the first place because you, because you want to see these performance differences. For once, you, you could tell your um, database provider that, uh, hey, uh, every night uh, in this uh, time range, the performance degrades. What is happening on your end? I can, you, you can prove it because you have a series of tests. Or maybe you are um, having some configuration problems or you can do some configuration tuning, which would uh, be the case for configuration tests where you compare multiple settings or maybe you can, pr you can provision more or less resources to your da managed database. So that, that would be the, the ground from where you build up to, to get a better understanding on how your managed database uh, behaves. Um, I'm not sure if that answered. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you can, uh, or the question is, how, how do you actually deal with traffic spikes in the, uh, in a, in a, in a cloud environment? And, um, if you, if you, uh, are, uh, if you should go for, uh, auto scaling versus, or maybe even combined with, uh, over provisioning so that you have enough capacity, um, um, and, and, and uh, the, the other comment was that uh, most, of, most of the time you, you can't really, really predict a, a traffic spike. This is, this is true. Sometimes it is true, um, um, especially when, when we are asked uh, to test things because um, yeah, customers plan a big ma marketing campaign or coordinated cross-media campaign, uh, campaign, then you can sort of uh, yeah, um, guess what, what the traffic spike will look like if it really happens. Um, but uh, otherwise, yeah, you, you can't really fully prepare for that because it's a big, it's a, it's a big unknown. If you if you are expecting such a traffic spike, then most of the cases solely relying on auto scaling uh, won't really work uh, in my experience because um, it's first it's really hard to get all those scaling policies right and to optimize your server images in a way that they actually boot up really fast and are ready and, and, and it serves uh, fast enough. So, um, and you really, uh, at least for AWS, this is the case, um, you, you, you see that all those services at, at, at AWS are more designed to run on a, on a bigger scale. You, you have um, not only one instance per uh, uh, per, per availability zone, but multiple ones, and you you have to have some degree of free capacity of headroom in order to absorb the 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 the, the incoming wave and to give you more time to spin up more uh, more instances. And if you are expecting such a spike, um, then yeah, you you can basically prepare for it and just ramp up your desired capacity a little bit so that you 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 can uh, absorb uh, the traffic better and. Otherwise, yeah, I'm not really, there, there, there is no general solution and uh, no perfect general solution to that particular problem, actually. Sure. So, uh, it's not kind of strange because um, I thought that your idea is about um, um, checking the um, scalability. So, um, if I know my system can scale, I can like the first and yeah. select the best from other services. And then the next question, the next question is for Claudia mentioned, I think. So, um, how valuable are the metrics I get from monitoring on top and from performance monitoring of messaging? Performance measures? Uh, <laughs> Measurements. For example, if I've got a system that my definition is alone, it's something totally different. Yeah. If I've got some other users scanning up that system. It, it, um, this is a, okay, 
Yeah, okay, you, you are, um, let me check if I can uh, summarize the question. Um, you are having uh, trouble um, with uh, the argument that you, that you can do run or that, that you should run performance tests against the cloud if you have an environment that, that, is, that is changing. And not only because you are changing it because uh, the, the provider itself is or other customers that are using these infrastructure are having an inf influence on your system as well, right? So the noisy neighbor problem, for example, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, this is, um, this is quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, I, I get this question actually a lot. Um, and um, from there are some ground rules. I'm 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 particularly familiar uh, familiar with AWS. I'm not so sure about all the, the the other cloud environments out there. But for AWS, I can say that um, if you if you avoid some very basic stupid ideas like using these micro instances for your production traffic, for example, that that have a they 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 can have or what was it called? I, can, I think. Credits, CPU credits, or so. So for a short amount of time, they can do a lot better uh, in terms of CPU performance. And then for the rest of the hour, you are throttled to 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 a low, low lower level level. This is in general a really bad bad idea. Um, um, but most of the time, um, the noisy neighbor problem is actually not not such a big uh, big thing if you are. Using instance sizes that are typical typical for for the production environment. So, for example, when it comes to network network performance, we 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 utilize the AWS network quite a lot because we are running tests from a couple of megabit per second to double digit gigabits per second range, and we rarely see any fluctuation or big big fluctuation in the in the network performance or packet performance. Actually, so if you are Using HVM virtualization, for example, and use the correct settings in, on your on your on your servers, we rarely see um, a big uh, change in the in the general performance. If you are running, uh, I don't know, a mission mission critical stock exchange application, then maybe you don't want to run it in the cloud in the first place. But uh, for most of the uh, applications that are uh, running, it, it 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 is it is quite. Um, uh, was uh, the the performance is quite predictable for the for this uh, cloud environment at, le at least for those mature uh, providers and th this is at least our our observations and the observations of our of our customers so that would make it quite comparable at least within a, a specific uh, margin of error we have other other experience when it, when it comes to that. okay okay yeah <laughs> You looked a bit skeptical, so uh, <laughs> yeah. Normally, or one more thing uh, I like to add is normally the biggest performance issues are problems that are uh, configuration based and yeah, just development stuff, engineering stuff, bugs that that were introduced uh, into the systems. So normally you have to work through a lot of stuff before you you actually reach the area where you need to look at the underlying network performance. Yeah. So um, the question is about the the order in which to perform those methods, um, but the order is um, yeah. Not strictly speaking, normally we, we just do a quick low test to start, just to see roughly if you if you reach the area that you were actually aiming for, and then it highly depends if you if you are. If you are good, uh, then we run a scalability test directly to see, or a, stress a series of stress tests to, to, to determine the capacity and to see if your system scales beyond your limit. This is most of the time customers request when, when they are running on the cloud. Um, and then configuration testing is often used as a, as a, yeah, um, um, a, tr a troubleshooting or debugging tool or to, to quickly verify that, um, that, that the change you are 
um, uh, making in order to optimize the performance because you saw on the load test that you have a big problem here and you have an idea and you prototype it and, uh, and apply it, then you want to do basically a configuration test with the one version maybe versus the feature branch that you're testing. And if you are using a tool like, like we built, then you just hit a play button, run the test again and just compare, uh, compare these uh, things uh, to, to one another. But yeah. Um, even though I said that configuration testing is the most important and interesting thing, it, most of the time it isn't really that what we do uh, first, because you, first you have to see in, yeah, if you are hitting your goal um, a, at least uh, roughly. Yeah, um, most obviously I use my own, own, own tool most of the time. Um, and I'm pretty pretty familiar with uh, with uh, Zung, which is an Erlang-based um, um, performance uh, testing tool. Um, I yeah, I have to look into JMeter from time to time because customers are using it. JMeter, yeah, and yeah, there are lots of other other tools out there. But um, in the end, it doesn't really. I have to be careful because the sales guys are hating me for that. It doesn't really matter what tool you are using at least not at, at first, because it's much harder to, to get an idea on what you want to learn, what you want to test, how you want to test, how do you organize those tests, who, who is responsible for testing, uh, who should be present when you are doing a larger test. Those are all things that are much harder to, um, yeah, to, uh, to start with compared to yeah, picking the ideal tool for your solution, or yeah, automating it uh, to the to the um, last last extent. So, I would say the it is more more important to get started quickly and to have the first um, um, yeah to to first uh, the first results uh, quickly so that you can iterate on on that. And, and if you need to switch the tool or I, if you are happy with the tool, it yeah, it's something that at least from my experience, comes a little bit later. Okay. Was that uh, your question? Or was it answered? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks.